Paul, what was it like to go back in time to start with the the, the despoiling of the Ecuadorian rainforest and bring it to the present where there is this $19 billion judgment against Chevron in an Ecuadorian court that appears to be going nowhere. Yeah, this is an unusual story to look into. I mean, you, you can go and look at what exists in the rainforest in Ecuador today, which I did. Um, but the extraordinary thing about this story is that because it's been litigated for 21 years, there are just mountains of documents uh, describing often in, in first-person accounts what transpired beginning in, in the 1960s. There are memoranda, for example, from within Texaco where company executives are, are, are asking each other, should we line the waste oil pits, which would prevent line them. Pull, line them with concrete? And they say, well, how much would that cost? Well, maybe $4 million. Nah, let's skip it. And out of that kind of uh, casual corporate decision can come a uh, judgment, a court judgment, decades later, worth $19 billion. So, but hold on. Those who made that dis those decisions 19 right. years ago, how many years ago? Well, this was actually back in the yes, 60s all of a sudden 70s. I really So when those decisions were made, those people are long gone. Yes, that's true. Not only that, but the company is long gone because the company has been subsumed by a different company, Chevron. However, the way the legal system often works is the successor company inherits not just the assets of the company it acquires, but also its liabilities. And while Chevron said, we, we take no responsibility for this, Unfortunately, they've they're been, left uh, holding the bag. That's right. That's I want America countrywide stuff. I want everybody to buy this book. Hand it to me if you wouldn't mind. The Law of the Jungle by Paul Barrett, um, and find out the sort of details for themselves. Paul, why you're here is to tell us about the lessons yeah. that lie in right. this tale. All right. Well, two decades of legal warfare. What to, what to make of all of that? In the first place, as, as we were just saying, Texaco could have probably preempted most, if not all, of this problem by simply conducting itself in a more responsible way initially. Set the second big lesson is that Ecuador, the host country, was not a prostrate and passive uh, participant in all this. It actually was a partner in the exploitation of oil in its own rainforest. It did nothing. It looked the, the other way. And after it nationalized the oil industry in the early 1990s, it actually became a worse polluter than Texaco had, had ever been. The third what? big... Wait, oh, that's right. No, no pun intended. Wait, 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 wait. Just say that one more time? Right. Well, Texaco was basically kicked out of Ecuador in the early 1990s. Ecuador, its own national oil company, took over the same oil fields in the rainforest east of the Andes, and Petro-Ecuador over the years became every bit as bad a polluter, if not a worse polluter, than Texaco had been in the 70s and 80s. Making the case much harder for Don to Making the case to now, exactly, looking back through time, much, much harder to sort out. And the final big lesson, I think, is that if a crusading lawyer is going to ride in on his white horse, he has to follow the rules. He has to use the tools of the legal system, not of Robin Hood in the forest shooting arrows at the sheriff of Nottingham. He has to follow the rules, gather hard empirical evidence, and make a legal case. And I have to say that it is hard not to walk away from this book coming to the conclusion that Donziger could have and perhaps should have conducted himself very differently from what he's been doing for the past several well, years. Well, that's not just your conclusion or my conclusion. That's the conclusion of a federal judge sitting in southern Manhattan who ruled in, in May that Don, in, excuse me, in March, that Donziger is liable under U.S. racketeering law, who ruled that his lawsuit over time evolved from what might have started as a legitimate environmental lawsuit into a racketeering conspiracy. So right now, Chevron has actually turned the tables on the plaintiffs, on the victims in Ecuador, and it's Chevron that holds the upper hand and may never pay a dime of those billions of so dollars. So what could happen to him? Well, in theory, he could be disbarred if this uh, finding is upheld. It's very, un un it's very unusual for a lawyer to be found to be a racketeer and then just to go on and practice law. However, Donziger is appealing, and we'll see what happens in front of the federal Are there any parallels wow. to be drawn between what happened in this case, no. the Chevron case in the Ecuadorian jungle, or the Texaco case more precisely, right. and what's unfolding now in the Gulf in the wake of the Macondo blowout. Right. Actually, the contrasts are much more uh, important than, than any similarities. Yes, you've got two environmental disasters. One, and however, two big oil companies as and, a root of them. And two multinational oil companies, both of which probably behaved in ways that they could have, uh, could have been much better. The big difference is that BP disaster unfolded in real time on television. This case unfolded in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in the remote rainforest, and as a result is clouded with a lot of ambiguity that you don't see in the BP case.